What is up, football fans? I am Danny Austin. This is the live from the 55 podcast here, recording live-ish in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We are on the Wednesday of the Calgary Stampede. Everyone's looking a little bit older, a little bit more disheveled, but, you know, we're here. We're talking football. We're talking CFL. We're talking a lot about Calgary Stampeders, and we have a very fun show um, on deck today. Uh, first up, I literally five minutes ago called up my buddy Ian Busby. He's been on the show before. Uh, great man. Covered the Calgary Stampeders for a really long time. I said, Ian, I need you. Can you Zoom? He said, Danny, I'm not Zooming. I'm coming to the studio. So he is going to be here at any moment. And we're going to talk probably 10, 15 minutes of Stampeders, trying to make it worth his while, trying to make it worth your while. But I think there is a lot going on with the team that I cover on a day-to-day -day basis, including if you haven't checked out their social media, uh, today was the day where rescue puppies were brought to the stadium. And uh, pardon me if I if I say this honestly, it was adorable. Um, I, I've posted pictures of myself with puppies trying to get those likes. You know how it is. Uh, speaking of which, please like and subscribe. Um, after that, we have coming straight at you from Hamilton, Ontario. Louis Butchko. I believe that's how I say his last name. We're going to ask. Friends with Louis for a really long time. He worked with, for the Thai Cats for a really long time. He was the guy who, when I had questions about the Thai Cats, I always knew I could go to Louis. I, I sort of think he's one of the smartest guys around our game and a guy I think more people should know and more people should should follow and, and hear what he has to say about the league. I think he's a he's a real smart cookie. That one. Um, I'm not sure why I said smart cookie. A lot of regrets here. As I said, it is the Wednesday of Stampede. Uh, I've been having a great time. Nothing too crazy. I did just read a book about Tall Ships, The Wager by David Grant. Suggest that you check it out. Finished that last night. Um, moving on, though. I don't know. I think we're uh, kind of at an interesting spot in the league schedule. Um, that's what I want to talk about to start. It's just sort of a conversation I had. I'm not going to say with who, but uh, with, with, with a guy around the league. And, and he sort of said that right now the way he sees the league is that there are kind of three tiers. Um, you have a tier one where you've got the Argos, the Lions, and, and the Bombers. And, and for me, I, I have the Argos at number one on my personal power rankings. But I do think that, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to break them into tiers. And that's what um, my contact or the person I was talking to was saying. And, yeah, I think you got to group those those three teams together. I think that right now they're the ones who have come out the gates sort of looking the best. Uh Obviously, the Argos beat the Lions. The Lions beat the Bombers. Nobody's beaten the Argos. But they're the teams that, to me, sort of feel the most locked in. Uh, they're the teams that I will argue I would pick them to beat any of the six other teams in, in the league, which is sort of why we've broken this into um, three tiers. And in that in that tier two, sort of below that, you got the Riders, you, you've got the Alouettes, the Stampeders, in my opinion, like I, I think I'm willing to sort of include the Ticats in there. And these are the teams I, I don't know why exactly – you know, I, I don't know that they're all the same thing. I, I don't think that I can look at the Thai Cats and the Alouettes and say, oh, you know, they're in similar spots, or even the Riders and the Stampeders. But I, I, I think that I would expect these teams to lose to those Tier 1 teams and then beat the Tier 3 teams. Um, and I also think that these are teams that I'm expecting to make improvements and I'm not sort of ruling out. Obviously, I covered the Stampeders. We're going to go a lot into them. I think that their pass game needs a lot of work, but I, I, I do think that you expect things to get better as the season goes on. And if they do that, then I, I think that they could give, you know, they, they'd, they'd go on a run potentially and, and be in the playoffs and, and be difficult. And I, I certainly think the riders um, are the same way. The riders are finding ways to win games. It's not always pretty, but they're winning. And this is a, this is a sport. It's about wins and losses. And, and the Alouettes obviously started strong. have slowed down a little bit, but there's enough there. Uh, I know that I think that, whether it's their offensive line or whether it's Cody Fajardo, who this is not the first time he's getting talked a lot. I think that there are questions there, but I still think that there are some nice pieces and you got to give the Alouettes a little bit of respect for how they've come out. And then the Thai Cats, look, the quarterback situation isn't isn't what you want it to be. Uh, I don't know when Bo will be back. I don't know if Bo will be back and if he'll ever be the player that you know we were used to seeing him. But I, I, I do, anyways, my point with those, why I have these four teams who are in, in different places and, and, and maybe I'm being easy on the Stampeders here. Maybe I'm being easy on the Thai Cats. I, I, I don't think that I am. But I just do expect them to continue growing and getting better. And I just, I'm not willing to rule them out as potentially teams that could get hot and, and give those tier one teams uh, a real push. And, and then that third tier, you know, I think we got to be honest, is the Elks and the 
Red Blacks. I, I feel bad lumping in Ottawa with Edmonton here. I, I really like a lot about Ottawa, um, particularly defensively, but it's just, you know, you lose Jeremiah Mazzoli and Tyree Adams to super talented quarterbacks. Absolutely broke my heart to see what happened to Mazzoli, and I was really excited to see Tyree Adams continue to develop. And, you know, I, I just think there's a legitimate reason for concern there. Um, again, it stinks. I'm not happy about it. But, um, you know, I, I can't, I don't necessarily see them getting hot. So I have to include them in this lower tier with the Elks. And, and what, what are you going to say? Edmonton is Edmonton. Uh, something that I'm deeply concerned about. I don't like the crowd sizes. I, I, I don't like sort of how that organization has become a bit of an embarrassment right now. Um, not necessarily, you know, on the business side, but on, on the football side. I wish there was a quarterback there. I wish that the Elks were relevant and contenders but they haven't been a while and sort of like win a game at home one and then we can sort of talk about you moving up in my three-tier system here but i do think those are those are my three tiers you know again tier one argos bombers lions tier two riders alouettes tie cats stampeders and then tier three the elks and red blacks and uh you know for anyone who would question why i have that tier one sort of so so distinct i i was just looking and you know as much as the cfl doesn't have the stats that they should have um they do do sort of a weekly stats uh like league-wide stats round up it's a pdf it's honestly incredibly useful for for reporters doing their jobs and you know i just go through it and it's okay well points for toronto number one 40 i'm not going to do all the numbers but bc winnipeg offensive points toronto bc winnipeg touchdowns bc toronto winnipeg offensive touchdowns bc toronto Winnipeg points allowed BC ah, points allowed becomes a little more confusing. <laughs> really Ottawa is second in the league in points allowed Montreal's third. Um, you know, actually Toronto and Winnipeg are fourth and fifth, but there's a part of me that, I mean, particularly when it comes to Toronto, Toronto's blown some teams out this year. So it's like, if you look at their passing yards, it's significantly less. Uh, I believe that they are sixth in passing yards per game at about 250 but they haven't needed to pass the ball late in games. So, you know, those situations where teams, a quarterback might pick up, you know, 100, 120 yards in the final couple minutes of, of the fourth quarter, the Argos don't need to do that. And I just honestly, um, it's basically every category. One of BC, Toronto, or Winnipeg is leading, and the other two are generally right behind. Um, and, you know, we don't have all the situational stats here, but I just, I can't help but look at those, at those stats, look at the standings, and it's just, it's it's not just that they're winning it's that they're they're kind of dominating and they're doing everything i mean I, i'm trying to find right now in my email um a great podcasting i apologize i was going to have this up you know the cfl also sends out this uh, you know this week in the cfl for week six and you look at toronto and for anyone who's questioning them it's like okay toronto's averaged the l lowest in the league in rushing yards allowed per game 57.7 and yards per rush allowed 3.6 they lead the league with one rushing touchdown allowed pretty good uh the argonauts are plus nine in turnover ratio they've got four giveaways to 13 takeaways and those takeaways have resulted in 65 of their 120 total points um you know they've got a couple other things about chad kelly here but that's not totally totally relevant and my point here is that these argos they're doing the things that you want a team to do and i've got to say it's not just ryan dinwiddie who got extended yesterday stuff's always weird to talk about because i obviously have relationships with a number of sort of the argos coaching staff but look what Corey mace is doing with that defense is absolutely incredible um i've said this on the podcast before but all that i want in a champion in any league is come back and defend it make the rest of the league come and take it from you and you know i think that there were a lot of people who who didn't necessarily feel like the argos were the best team in the league last year even though they won the championship I'm not saying I believe that, but I do think that there was, it was understood a little bit that Winnipeg had been start to finish. They just couldn't get over the finish line. That's what matters. I'm not saying that's not what matters, but I think it's good for the league that the Argos have now come out and been that team um, and, and defended the, they're going to make whoever beats them. If someone beats them this year, you are going to have to, you know, pry the Greg cup from the Argos cold dead hand. I mean, they're going to make you work for it. And I love that. I think it's good for the league. Obviously, having good teams in Toronto and Vancouver right now is a is a very good thing for the league. People are going to say, oh, no one's paying attention. I don't care. Stop being negative. It's a positive. It's better that we have good teams. Uh, I think that we will see it start getting energized. And you know what? Montreal, again, as I've said, Montreal looked okay too. And that was a real concern. Those are markets that have been concerned. I don't know when the last time 
we had really good Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver teams. That that cannot be bad for the league. Yes, it is bad for the league that a market as important as Edmonton is really suffering right now. But you know, you got the good with the bad. And look, I like that there's this sort of tier one. I like that it includes a Bombers team that Winnipeg is so passionate about, and then a Lions team that has overcome the loss of a superstar quarterback in Nathan Rourke, and then a Toronto team that really looks like, you know, it has the it has the potential to, to repeat, possibly. It's still early. I'm not saying any of this is written in stone. The very premise of Tier 2 is that they have the potential to, you know, throw this throw this whole idea on its head a little bit. Um, looking forward looking forward to some of those teams making a run, pushing those Tier 1 teams. But, yeah, I thought that was interesting when, uh, when the person I was speaking to, trying not to reveal too much here, brought that up. And he said, look, everyone else is trying to figure it out, but there's three teams at the top, and – you know, I, I broke it down a little bit more here. So I don't know. Hope that was interesting. We have Ian Busby coming right up. Then we got a boy, Luco. No, not Luco. My boy, Louie. Um, I was stressed about his last name and I just said Luco. <laughs> what was I doing? Um, I'm still learning this podcast thing, guys. Um, but one thing I'm not learning is how much I love Fraser and Fig, our sponsor. Um, did not buy the charcuterie board. Did not get organized um, in time to do that. We're going to do it one of these days. Hopefully when I have a guest in the studio. Maybe next time Ian Busby is in, but I have grabbed one of their charcuterie boxes and they are absolutely incredible. Um, it's ready to go. Cheese, charcuterie boxes curated with local and artisanal ingredients. They got four sizes. If you want an individual, they got that. If you're hosting a party, they got that. They got everything in between. Um, all of the boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. And their selections do vary month to month, so you're not getting the same thing every time you go. I cannot recommend them enough, and that is not only because um, they're our sponsor, although I'm very grateful that they are our sponsor. And, uh, yeah, it's an amazing product here in Marta Loop. Honestly, just just down the road from our studio. So please check them out. Let them know that we sent you. Um, Stampede's almost over here in Calgary. So, you know, who doesn't want a charcuterie board next time you have a nice, quiet picnic? Um, all the tents will be gone, and you can just, you know, have a nice charcuterie board. A little classy. Anyways, guys, thank you so much. We're going to get to Ian Busby here and then Louie, not Luco. All right, Ian Busby in the studio. Uh, you have been on live from the 55 before. Um, yes, but making a second appearance already. Making a second, I think you might be. Darren Bombing, I believe, has been on twice, but I think that you are my... And John player. Bender. Oh, yeah, John Bender's been on twice. I'm an, I'm an avid fan of the podcast, so well, I, I, I've been keeping track. Yeah, that yeah. means a lot. That means a lot. Thank yeah. you. And thank you to all of our listeners. Um, I mean, again, the sort of plan initially, and it's just that we have conflicting schedules. Yes. But like my sort of plan was that you were going to be on every week on oh, Sunday. I know. And but... just recap. And it just like the timing just doesn't work. So we're going to get you on whenever we can. Right. Because you don't want to do this when I'm free, which is later in the evening. Because he wants to work late in the evening on a Sunday. He wants to make my producers work later in the oh, evening. And right. Get this I know. Um, I but... offered to produce, but I mean. Nobody wants that. We're, let's move on. Uh, this is, it is a delight to have you on. I'm excited um, to be here. A good friend. I, I just like took a flyer from downtown up on a scooter. So yeah, which to me, again, I would question whether the finances. I, I honestly do think we need to talk about football, but yes. um, but I will say that riding a scooter, a which I don't do really, but b, I, I think that between that and an Uber, the cost right, probably it was is probably right in between the distance of Uber would have been just on the cusp of being more affordable. But your baseline on an Uber is nine bucks. It cost me seven. Fair. Now, so, since it is Calgary Stampede and I'm a nearly 40 year old man, I do want to just quickly, any kids <laughs> listening, just don't, don't ride so you your guys, Ubers or your scooters home. Take an Uber. Yeah. And I'm, um, and I'm one of these guys that I find these scooter people to, and they're flying around at two in the morning and scaring the bejesus out of me. If I'm walking down the street and I'm seeing these scooters, I'm like, oh God, somebody's going to break a wrist. I never know and how I much I to break wrists. Don't, so. I know. I, uh, Several years ago, I was hit by a car while riding my bike. I have told the story, but I will tell it again. I don't think it's told on the podcast. I then went to, you know, I had to go get stitches yeah. um, and went through the whole triage nurse thing, whole thing. And they put me in just a row separated by curtains. And yeah. The doctor came in and was like, like, listen. And I just listened. There was a bunch of men talking. He was like, that is all men between the ages of 20 and 40. And all of them were on either scooters or bicycles, like biking home drunk. And I was, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that I was drunk. I just happened to be oh, riding late. my bike late. Yes. Um, and yes. So guys, be careful out there. Ian Bosby, how do you feel about the Calgary St. Peters right now? Uh, not great. Uh, no, not great at all. Uh, and I'm looking at this week and going, 
oh my god they got they got to win if you're, you're not going to be three games back and then lose the uh the, the season series to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders you can't do that yeah I think that's the tiebreaker is where this starts coming in yes right? yeah. and it, we're already talking that and I'm like oh man now you got to get your offense to get clicking and fast like it's and what are you going to look at going through the east division uh at this time of year i don't know i i don't feel great about it. i look at the, the good teams in this league right now and i find that there's three in that top tier this is my intro it was about oh sorry did I, no. did I did i did i steal this i didn't this read is, your no, intro this is great. No, you didn't hear it no there are, there are three tiers yeah and they're in the bottom of the middle tier and yep. they to move into that top tier, they're going to have to start. The top tier is, two. and we're not, I don't want to do the one, two, three, but again, yeah. let's just repeat my intro here a little bit, but also this is your take. This is hilarious, but is obviously Toronto, uh, BC, BC and, and, and Winnipeg. Yeah. And then and the then, next one is Sask. I have the tie cuts in there. Yes. Um, and then Calgary and who's the fourth? Saskatchewan. Montreal. Uh, Montreal. Yeah. yeah. And then Ottawa. And then Ottawa and yeah. Edmonton are in Which the I feel bad tier. for Ottawa, but yes. Um, yeah. And that's the thing is, again, like that tiebreaker when you have a nine team league is huge yeah. and you, they can't, they like can't. It gives you an now, extra game in hand. Right. It's yes. Like, I will say, because I want to ask you about Jake Mayer. I want to ask you about the offense, but one thing that I, I, I did a story on this um, today, to be honest, because I, I was just looking the CFL to their credit has their stats report up um, at the end of every week and opposition, big play returns, which are defined as 30 plus yards on punch or field goal missed yeah. or 40 plus yards on kickoff returns. Okay. So pretty, I mean, big play is an accurate thing. Yeah. Um, opposition. Calgary has allowed five. No other team in the league has allowed more than three. Montreal and Ottawa have both allowed zero. Okay. Meanwhile, the Stamps have one big play return themselves. I do think, look, it's a Mark Killam coached special teams unit, so yeah. those improvements are going to get made. Um, I do think you have players coming in and out of the lineup. The Stampeders have a tremendous amount of injuries. The situation is difficult. That said... For anyone who is saying that this is just the offense, no, they are losing the field position battle on special teams, and that that is, that is also an issue. And I do think, on some level, Jake Mayer, I don't think he's been good, but I do think that there's a little too much focus on him and not yes. enough focus on the fact that the defense has been pretty great, yeah. to be honest, but it's not just him. No, 100%. And I look at the – so this past week, they the big turning point in this game against Winnipeg was this missed field goal by Renee and the big return – all the way down into Stampeders territory. And it's like, that is just a swing that you can't like when you have that type of swing, it just deflates the team. And it's, it seemed to deflate the stamps. They never scored another point after that. Mm -hmm. So after that happens, I'm like, you just allow that. And you're just, and everybody's walking off the field going, Oh man, we should be up what 13 at the, that time or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then you, you don't, you come back in there and like, and they get on the board and then they get some momentum and then they put up 23 points in a row and finish out that game. Then in week one, the first drive, they missed a field goal, and it just felt like, okay, they need points. You know, put points up. And then that game, they missed two field goals. And had When your offense return. is struggling, you can't have six-point swings. And you can't have, you can't have these, big, you know, these big problems on, in other areas of the game, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, I also will say that, I mean, they are one in three. Um, full marks to the Riders. Yes. They beat them, but that was an overtime game. It was close. I do think that there were like, there's not nothing there to like about the Stampeders. Right. Um, they were pretty tight with the Bombers for for most of that game. Well, they, they played a decent first half. It's you look at the totality of it, and 122 passing yards. Yeah. It's just not. I guess 127 because Tommy Stevens had five passing yards. Right. Um, but it's not good enough. But like, there's things to like there. That SAS game. Honestly, I know that you don't play for ties. Like maybe run the ball with Tedrick Mills for one one more play instead right. of doing a little bit of a risky throw into the end zone. Um, although it can be debated whether that's risky, I will say that I mean it was well, very when they get, similar when the to a couple get down interceptions. In the red zone, Bo used to throw. Yeah, well, when the stamps get down in the red zone, and it has been the case for the last couple of years, their best offense is running the ball. And Kadeem Carey just felt like he had how many fifteen to Tedrick Mills has been great. Yeah, and that's yeah. the thing. Like, but I'm saying Kadeem Carey, that was he used to be his bread and butter, like fifteen yard touchdown runs because mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect him to just like boom boom in the end zone into the end zone mills has been just as good and he started that game so hot and it was just like okay you need the passing game to complement that run game you can't just and i think his numbers end up being pretty like then you have like 70 some yards on his first seven carries and then and 97 and then seven carries for 23 yards because it's 
okay, if you're just, if all you're going to do is run the ball on us, we're going to stop that. Mm-hmm. And then you have to be able to adjust as an offense. But uh, looking at those defenses right now, they're like, okay, we're going to put you in second and long, and then we're going to give you a six, seven yards, and then you're not, you're not going to be able uh, to and, 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 down. The, and teams will just stack the box. It's not that hard to eventually shut down the yes. run game without a pass game, no matter how good your guy is. Um, I do want to ask about the pass game, though. And then I want to ask about some other teams around the league, but, you know, this is a Calgary-based podcast. You have been around this team much longer than I did. I mean, who was the first quarterback that you covered of the Calgary Stampers? Oh, God. Well, uh, back in the – it was Marcus Crandall at one point was in time. Okay. Yeah, and then it was, like, the Tommy Jones era. And, <laughs> and, uh, and We then pretend that doesn't exist. Kahari Jones, and then Burris came in, and Burris was yeah. the quarterback for seven years, passed over to Drew Tate, Kevin Glenn. And Bow. over to blue over a bow, and then now here we are now, right? So I uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of a few different types of quarterbacks, and it's always the, the run game has always been exemplary throughout that entire period of time. Joffrey Reynolds came in in 2004, he passed over to John Cornish, then it was Jerome Messam, and then Kadeem Carey now, and somebody missing yes. in between there, but I don't. When know we talk name. specifically, move over about six inches here. Just want to center you in the frame. Um, this is me trying to trying to be a, mid-game producing. Look yeah, at this. I know. Usually you do that in your headset and you wouldn't hear it. But. It's it's what yeah, it's what the people want. <laughs> um, okay. Is it possible that and because honestly, I get a lot of emails. I'm not criticizing. Email me. It's fine. I won't yeah. always reply, but I, there's nothing I can actually do about anything that you're emailing me or DMing me about. But if you want to email <laughs> fix me, fix it, Danny, yeah, fix it. If you want to email me about the quarterbacks, I, I will read it. I promise I read everyone. Um, are you, you're not promising to reply to everything. No, okay. <laughs> I, I basically stopped replying. Yeah. Um, but you reply, there is, you pro, reply to your email is just like you reply yeah. to my texts. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> occasionally. Calgary fans, occasionally is what you say. Are Calgary fans being a little bit impatient with Jake Mayer? Yes, but I understand why, because in, in when you went, when Henry Burris came in in 2005, they were an instant contender. When Drew Take took over, he had enough talent that everybody thought we were a contender. Mm-hmm. And it was then it was Kevin Glenn, and it was like, well, he's good enough. We're a contender. And Bo Levi Mitchell takes the reins. And Bo Levi Mitchell, let's 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 be honest, his start of his career was unprecedented. 100%. So we can't you we until can't, probably the end of 2018. I am guessing he had a shot at yeah. being at being the greatest greatest CFL winning quarterback. quarterback of all time yeah yeah and like his win percentage was uncharted like yes and that's why and every game and it was like hey he's 26 and 3 or something like but fans turned on him last year like yes. it's it's or and the year before so right you know there's i just think that there's an expectation and i think jake is young and i i don't think he has the accuracy right now that we saw in the first the start of his career I also, and I'm not trying to make excuses. People get so mad at me and say I'm trying to make excuses. Part of it is that it's not interesting to just come to a conclusion and stick to it. So you right. have to try to figure out reasons. Right now, Jalen <laughs> Philpott and Malik Henry were supposed to be his starters. Yes. Um, they are both out probably for the whole season. Reggie has been in and out of the lineup. Mark and Michelle, you don't just come back after five years and being, I, I being in and out of the I NFL. Know, but he looked pretty good in this game. And I thought, okay, we, we but if Bagleton and Michelle and Odin Dukes, okay, they just have to keep that group together and yes. keep, keep moving forward. Yes, but the expectation that these guys are going to be currently clicking at a midseason level, they're Absolutely. nowhere near there yet. Now, I do think, I, I don't love the way that Jake has necessarily handled pressure, and I do think that the offense sort of has these release valves for him where he just throws really short passes. And that's not on Jake necessarily, but when when pressure comes at him, that's what it does. And it doesn't really, it's not exciting. And I'm not sure that it's working right now. So when you had Derek Dennis and Julian Good Jones and a little bit more more time, I think he needs that extra split second right now as a young quarterback does. Yes. You know, like they don't, it's not all muscle memory for them yet. And especially when they don't know their receivers as well. I mean, they're still starting rookies at one of the, at arguably, well, arguably two of the Canadian possessions. Trey Williams Drukes had started what two games prior to this year? There <laughs> it is young. It's a young now yeah. is there a bigger question about 
why are the Stampeders the only team that can't seem to sign their own players? Um, yeah. I'm joking. I really am joking because I think people forget that they've signed Mike Rose, Derek Wigan, yes. Cam Judge. They have Brandon Dozier, uh, Trey Roberson. Like they have an elite squad. And in certain cases, like Fuller and Armalade leaving, guys, the Argos are paying Chad Kelly a rookie salary. <laughs> they had more money. The Stamps wanted to keep him. I have made yes. the mistake of sort of saying, oh, the Stamps let him go. You can't. You couldn't have kept him. I I just ultimately, like, I do think that there's a level where there hasn't been the continuity that some fans would like and that they are willing to blame that a little bit and say, well, this team was supposed to sort of be building together and then there are these major changes. I don't know that that's true because if I look at it, Jameer Thurman, huge loss. Mike always leading the league in tackle yeah. right now. Um, like, the defense has been absolutely exceptional. I just think that you are dealing with a very young offense that hasn't quite figured it out yet. Right. Okay, who are the offensive stars that around the league that the Stamps should be having right now that they don't have right now? Here's the thing. The Stamps look at their roster and they set out their salary structure and they stick to it. Mm -hmm. And they aren't going to cheat the system. They're, they're, they stay under the cap. They're, they abide by the rules. I'm not saying, saying all other teams don't, but some other teams don't. And those players are going for a bit more money in other places. And they have an exceptional interior O-line that is yes. incredibly expensive Yes, that sets up a run game That's that where, they rely on, this right? Is, this yeah. is where they want to spend their money. Exactly. Yeah. Here's the thing. The reason that the Stamps have all these ex-players and other... They're great at recruiting. They bring guys in who are CFL players. And other teams go, yeah, they, they found another one. Yeah. And a couple of years later, we're, they're, let's get that guy. We can't find him. We, we, the Stampeders are the ones that are bringing these guys in. The Stampeders recruiting staff has always done a great job. Exactly. And that's why it's like, okay, well, we'll let you go. We will brought you into the league. We built you up for a couple of years. You got your value and then your, your salary needs to increase and we can't do it. Good luck to you. That's why we see the Toronto Argonaut Stampeders right now. So, well, and, and I mean, I think that that is like, I, and I'm with coaches. Too. I'm sort of asking you questions that I get asked more than questions that I have here. Yeah. Um, and that's, because I, the reality is, I, I, I don't actually know the answers to some of these questions, <laughs> but I, I do think people say, "Well, look at Toronto; that was all here. Why couldn't they stay?" And I mean, I do think that the cost of the quarterback is yeah. a big part of it. Um, and there's a, the other, like, I don't know, I don't know where Toronto's money seems to come from, but well, I, yeah. I love okay. playing. Sean McEwen's a guy I would pay a lot of money to. Mike Rose is a guy I would pay a lot of money to. Yes. Trey Roberson, <laughs> Reggie Bateson. I, I love the St. Peter's high-end talent, and I just think when it clicks, no one asks those questions. It's not clicking right now, right. so those questions are coming up. But I also but have people saying the Stamps have never been this bad early. Guys. Do we, do we remember two years ago? When two they years ago, out? they were two and five. <laughs> That's what I like. Two and then years they ran ago. off five straight wins. Yes. Yes. And it was so, a weird COVID season. But th this team has been in this place before. I'm not saying everything is going to be okay. Yeah. But I am saying that a little bit but, of patience yeah. is okay. But if you look at the next few weeks here. You got riders. Well, yeah, let me do it. Let you me got, pull it up. You got Red Blacks after that. Red Blacks are a, a shell right now. They will now. beat the Red Blacks. Yeah, and then then Winnipeg, I think. No, then, no, then they're in, at in Montreal, Montreal. Which historically is a loss. Um, doesn't in matter. Montreal? I don't know. Oh, they always lose in Montreal. Yeah, well, it's the nightlife yeah. in Montreal. I, we don't know that. We don't know that. It always has uh, been and it always <laughs> will be, especially I on a Sunday. Said Ian so. Busby, not Danny <laughs> Austin. Well, and then you have then you have Toronto at home. That's going to be a tough game, BC. Yeah. I mean, August no, is no, <laughs> August is brutal. Yeah. Toronto, BC, Winnipeg, Toronto in four, four games. Yeah, but that then, is where you're back to back against Edmonton. So if this team doesn't have it figured out by the end of July. Yeah. So you have at Sask, Ottawa at home. At Montreal. This is why I'm saying this this week is very important game. Yes. Because you want to get Ooh. back to, like, if you want to get back to 500, you're going to win the next two weeks. And then you're looking at Toronto. Uh, Toronto, BC, Winnipeg, Toronto. We talked about those tiers. That is yeah. a brutal August. I hadn't actually put two and two together. That is rough. And you, you basically need to try to split those games. Yes. Um, And then you have two against Edmonton, and the and season goes on from there. And Montreal we're, again. We don't need to look that so far you, ahead. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. This is Saskatchewan game. This is massive. And it's again, uh, I think that the Stamps could have beaten them two weeks ago at home. Yes. I do. I think that was, a, I mean, it was double overtime. Of course they could have. But I, I know that that's a loss that stung a little bit because they were like, ah, we should have had that one. Yeah. Well, um, they were they were literally one pass away. So yes. it was one play away from winning. And uh, credit to Marshall on the Riders. He made a great play. Picked that ball off. Like, you, sometimes they're going to make good plays against you. So I like, yeah, and it, it's like, I have access to the CFL video database. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, like 
the 2017 Grey I Cup. I used to get them on DVDs. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually don't know how to log in anymore, but um, I, I literally, like, we're not allowed to share. It's obviously TSN property, so right. us in the media, but it's only us who have access. To be honest, I don't know what my access code is right now. It's only for your research purposes. Yes. yes. But I did cut a video, and it was, like, the 2017 the final pass um, yeah. that Bo got picked off in the end zone. Yeah. It was also the safety, like, so zipping over, over yeah. yeah, and doing it. And then there was another one the next season, and I was like, look how similar these passes are. But... I've lost the video that I like cut together oh, okay. that I couldn't share. Um, and it's just like a video <laughs> from me. And I think I sent it to Lucas Barrett at the CFL. And he was like, Danny, I, I don't care. Um, you're obsessed. <laughs> and I was like, so <laughs> see, these are the, these are the comments I used to get back from uh -huh. the CFL when I would <laughs> come up with a scenario and ask them about this. And generally, was, Oh, I wasn't even asking. I was like, Hey, look at this. Like look I know, how clever I it was, am. it was Steve Daniel. I used um, to bug, but Okay, yeah, can I ask you? Um, <laughs> okay, we had a there, couple of points there, and I can't remember. The there time. are. Well, the I mean, this is why I wanted yeah. This is the whole idea. I think we that, just come I, in. A couple other things I couldn't remember what, uh, but okay. keep going. I want to move on from the St. Peters. <laughs> um, there are three other games. I am going to read them off to you, and um, after I read all three games off to you, I need you to rank them in terms of I'm willing to skip stampede parties to watch them versus not. I don't if July 13th. <laughs> I, I said you were going to wait. July yeah. 13th, which is Thursday. Yeah. Um, Hamilton at Edmonton. July 14th, which is Friday. Toronto at Montreal. July 15th, earlier in the day, Winnipeg at Ottawa. Um, you have to rank those three games in terms of most likely to stay at home and skip whatever stampede parties are going to well, least likely. The the reason is the only one the only one that I will watch completely will be Winnipeg versus Ottawa. Not because it's a better game, but because it's in the afternoon. And I will be chained to a desk and watching it no matter what. But Toronto Montreal is the game of the week, other yep. than the stamps and riders. And I I think I'm, you can make the argument that Toronto Montreal might actually be the game of the week. Yeah. It's just that it actually is less significant to Toronto. Yes. Than the Calgary SAS game is to both teams. Yes. It's must win for Montreal. I mean, ah, must win. We're talking I, like, but no, like but Montreal it, really, really will want to win this one. Yes. Toronto, if they were to lose, it's not the end of the world. Calgary and Saskatchewan are going to be like, oh, damn. The, the yeah. Alouettes want to prove they're not a paper tiger here, right? They, yeah. and this is the, they're not the, going to. This is, this is a team, <laughs> this is a team that they, they, they're playing the Argos. They know they're going to have to go through the Argos eventually. And this, you're established. You, you're playing your, your fiercest rival and the team that you know you're going to have to beat. We're a media folks, so we're talking about, like, oh, this and that. Like, a lot can change, and realistically, yeah, same thing if you're in Montreal, and you're like, well, we would like the East Final at home. Right. Every game against the team that's most likely going to be exactly. your rival matters, you and yeah. Yeah. So Montreal, they win those two games early against Hamilton and Ottawa, and they're like, 2-0, and oh, they look good. And then after playing Winnipeg and BC, it's like 2-2, two and two, they don't look good, right? So this is their turning point game. You know, it's like the like game five of a best of seven playoff series is very pivotal. Like, what are we going to, which way are we going now? We're we going up or down. So this is like, I think they can look good in this game and still lose and feel good about themselves. The thing is they need to start getting Cody Fajardo to just understand you don't have to take all the sacks. Sacks allowed. 2023 CFL statistics through week five. The leading team, the least, is the Toronto Argonauts who have allowed only four sacks. Weirdly, the Stampeders have allowed only seven. Um, the worst team is the Montreal Alouettes who have allowed 22. Yes. In terms of sacks made, the Argos are at 11. I mean, they're nowhere near the the Lions who are leading with 21. 21 yeah. But um, but they, the, this Corey Mace defense, also, this they also... Corey Mace defense is going to be all over yes. Cody Fajardo if they don't get the ball out quickly. Well, that's yeah. going to be just the keys. Honestly, it's run we're, the ball a little bit. We've been bit. talking this about this for a few years about oh they need to protect Fajardo better. He needs to protect himself better. I was speaking with a Riders fan today who we were talking about these you know these grades that are given out the PPF yeah. or whatever, and he was like, well Montreal's offensive line keeps getting like really high grades despite them leading the leagues and sacks. Yeah. Sacked allowed. He's like, it's he's not like, all about sacks. And he was like, ah, the only thing is that it is Cody Fajardo. So maybe they are the best O line in the league. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, Riders fans are allowed to make that joke. But yeah, I mean, I do. I, that's my, if I'm Montreal right now, I, again, I think Cody's, his arms look pretty good. Yes. Um, it's he, just, he needs quicker processing speed and like to figure out where he's going with the football yeah. earlier. So now you it have, is, it's, it, we're talking about fractions of a second here. But again, yeah. 
that's his problem. So that is he, the most. He will take a sack to just save a play. He doesn't throw as many interceptions as you. As you so he doesn't get Which, himself into trouble. It's just there. again as a 39 year old who am like legitimately injured because I honestly I was the second batter in the first did, inning. Did you, you didn't get it in the oh, third, so, did you? Um, did oh, you yeah, make you it out on the play? Oh, dude, I like really fell down hard. And, like, <laughs> um, I'm having trouble walking, and my shoulder. I basically hit a ball pretty deep. It was it was a nice it was a nice cut. And as I was running around to second, I realized I was going to miss it. Instead of adjusting the way I run, yeah, decided to reach out my leg and try to like reach it as I went the other way. Oh, so I was rounding it. This isn't. I mean, this graphic. What I'm doing with my hands <laughs> this is <graphic>. terrible. <laughs> um, and I just like I basically like reached out fell right over on my side i am i am an absolute mess so i don't know who who would take sacks that is your first that so, what, so basically what we are saying right so now what, what you were saying is it hurts every time you see cody fajardo take it precisely yeah. yes precisely yeah. um thank you for clarifying eventually it catches up to you at the end of the year you're just like oh it, you're battered and bruised or mid-season if you're taking 22 hits like there's gotta there, be a stat like, there's somewhere not, there's not even all we don't even count all the times he gets hit after throwing right if the because CFL had he stats, seems to, he um, seems to get hit after throwing almost every play because he keeps the ball too long. Agreed. Okay. There's probably a stat somewhere out there that's just not available. Thank you, Genius Sports. Yeah. Um, that says how many times Corporate he's been sacked. Pressures and hits. And yeah. There can't sacks. be many guys who have been sacked more than Cody Fajardo over the last couple of years. So yes, I agree. That is that is my sort of of those remaining three. I know you need to pick. I mean, you, as you said, you're going to watch Bombers Red Blacks. That's but only because of the time of day. And I yeah, will that's going to be a desk and I will watch it. That is presumably going to be a massacre unless something really crazy happens, yeah. which I just don't see it happening. And that was in Ottawa, too. And then Hamilton and Edmonton. Um, again, I am actually firmly on the like, I no longer totally find it funny. I think Edmonton just oh, needs to win become, at home. It's become, it's become painful. And for it, it, they're going to, it's going to be 20 if they lose this one. Well, and the fans have turned against, like the fans just yes. don't show up anymore. And that is a problem. Yeah. Um, it is like, again, we need fans in Edmonton engaged. It's actually one of the great CFL markets. Yes. We talk about Winnipeg, Saskatchewan, but like, no, Edmonton historically has oh, been it's... and Commonwealth when it's full is beautiful. Um, I just think Hamilton like turned a little bit of a corner in week five. Um, um, I mean, they, they beat Ottawa. So yeah, but they had looked like a team that was beating itself. Yes. And, and then they stopped doing and that. And they stopped doing that. There was some better discipline. That team is, that's why I had them in that tier two. And I probably would have even if, well, if they'd lost Ottawa, they would have been in the bottom tier. Yeah. But I, I still believe there's too much talent there, right. particularly on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and they're, they're, I'm, and they're too veteran of a team, right? There's just too much there to go and say that this is not a team that. Yeah can't compete and similar to what i was saying with the stampeders like there comes a point where honestly some of their young american receivers are going to need to step up i've covered the cfl for a long time it normally takes guys five or six weeks oh, yeah. to figure out the canadian game devaris daniels who was most outstanding rookie mark and michelle like these guys are guys who it took them a little while to make the adjustments to the canadian game and figure out the way I go and you know how figure out how to use the big field and if one or two guys for hamilton kind of do that i i, I just think that the defense is going to keep them in games and if the offense can stay on the field so the defense doesn't get exhausted, which is always a big part of yes. Canadian football, um, well, then I think they'll be okay. So, I, I mean, I, I do sort of have them beating Edmonton while also not in a way that I'm, like, rooting, like, cheering in the press box, but also for the reasons that we just said, I, I'm worried about Edmonton. Um, it's Ed a community-owned team I, losing a lot of money. And I just feel this past week was rock bottom. It has to be rock bottom. How do you, where do you go from here? Losing on a kickoff point, Rouge, on a play that you should know. Now, whoever screwed that up, whether it was coaching or the player doesn't know, somewhere in the junction of it's that possible whole that thing, everyone. everyone should have been put up to speed on this. He, you got to go on the field knowing what you're doing in that situation. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just it's embarrassing to lose 12-11. I'm like, how many? Like they got most of their points off punt singles. Like. And yeah, they, I and they still, were right there to win that game. And I would they, argue they still were like, yeah, probably the better team. Yes, and that's the thing. So that was rock bottom. Was, that, the great thing about getting rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up. Yeah. Right. So win a game at home. I, I took that from the movie Sing, by the way. Yeah, a great, uh, a great film. You have children. I <laughs> it's I a not it's a quality it. film starring Matthew McConaughey. I've not seen Sing. Um, <laughs> I almost went to see the new Mission Impossible last night. Oh um, man, I, I I have not been as 
pumped for a movie in years is like Tom Cruise flying. Just up a mountain. quick digression that um, CFL fans are going to hate. In the next 10 days, we have that, the Barbie movie, which looks great, uh-huh. and Oppenheimer. Yeah. Just, like, what a time to. To have what a time being, to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's great about the Mission Impossible movie? All these movies, all the Mission Impossible movies have been on TV in the last few weeks. Dude, they're so so anytime I'm stuck at work and I get the TV on, I'm like, oh, it's amazing. And yeah. And Tom Cruise is flying off the side of an airplane and whatever. If you had to pick, and this is going to kind of be my last question, and I'm going to let you go because in my intro, I referred to, yeah, I referred to Louis. Because uh, I didn't, I, as I've admitted, I don't actually know how to say his last name, which I've Butchko? been. Butchko is how you're I saying. I think it. so. We're gonna ask him. But um, I don't. Uh, but I know, got. I, I mean, admitted. we were extremely into the sauce by the time I met Louis and spent many times with him at the the 2017 Grey Cup, and uh, he works with my uh, friend R.J. Broadhead on Hamilton broadcasts. So Louis is a legend. Yeah, R.J. is a legend. That would have been the Ottawa Grey Cup. Um, yeah. I did not spend as much time. With him, but I love no, Louis. You, He's you, literally you, you were doing this thing called working. Yes. Yeah. We but, were we were not. Um, <laughs> but I realized that like in my head it was Louis Boyko and I didn't know how to say it. This is all like he's gonna listen to this podcast and be like, Danny is a horrible friend. But the second time <laughs> I went to say it, I was like, Oh no, like in my head, and I went, I called him a Luco. Um, oh yeah so, luco that that's uh yeah. yeah. So he's gonna just, just call him Luco from now on. That's, my that's cool. Final question. Okay, of the non-tier one teams. So not including Toronto, Winnipeg, or BC. Yeah. Which team do you expect by Labor Day to be including in tier one? I I, I think it's the Calgary Stampeders. Okay. I mean, M- Montreal Alouettes have a chance. I mean, they all have a chance. But I think the Stampeders have the best chance because the, what I saw from the team to start that game in Winnipeg. Okay. The, the running game, when they, when they can balance it out with passing and running, they still have the best running game in the league. All right. They were, they're like, they're still trucking guys. And I, I love Mills. And Kadeem should be back relatively soon, right? which is going to give them a crazy one. And if they punch. can manage to put Mills and Kadeem on the, the field at the same time and just keep running those guys, that, that'll turn them into a team that, like okay, ball possession. We're on the field for three and a half minute drives. No more two and outs, right? It's just that type of thing. And I like I respect the answer, and I understand why you're saying it. My issue, and again, I, I would have and, t- 15 minutes ago you brought it to my attention, but um, when I looked at that August schedule, yeah, Toronto, BC, Winnipeg, Toronto. The thing is, they can make a ton of improvement, yeah, and be and, a much better team, and, and still not years. really be there. Because they've got a, they're but, playing catch up. But let's let's look back at that schedule in in twenty twenty one because I think they beat some. Can we? I don't, I don't. I don't. Uh, can you? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing: no. Mark, Mark and Michelle had one has won one game so far and have one week <laughs> the, of practice. How many practices did he have? The only thing that comes so up. Got to put it on the. Oh, uh, is that it? No, no. It's <laughs> only only the Grey Cups. You know, here's the thing: are available I, from I actually I I was on the website and I don't have the app, but. I was looking at the prep pass schedule and I was like, there was only one game last year. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. No, I'm pretty sure I can Wikipedia this. Well, didn't you get the little guidebook? Don't you have the guidebook saved? Anyway, Mark and Michelle is going to, once they start connecting. Deep, Shut up. Don't ask me about the guidebook. What? You you, uh, you love the guidebook. I've seen you. I, I love the guidebook. It. Okay. So Actually, there's a lot of information in that guidebook. So the thing is, once Mark and Michelle starts connecting deep, he starts re- getting this rapport with Jake Mayer. They will have the deep threat. Reggie Bagleton stay healthy. They have the underneath threat, and then uh, Odom's Dukes will be able to get his yardage. That'll balance out. And that balance out their yes. rushing game. And this will be since you made me go Wikipedia um, and then made a weird guidebook crack. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, at the Calgary St. Peter's in 2021 lost the Labor Day Classic to Edmonton, 23-20, and were one and four. Um, I remember like they went into a buy. Well, I guess the bye week would have been a couple weeks later. Yeah. Um, because then they were two and five. But after that game was the lowest in my seven years covering the team. Most of which they've been the, pretty the good. One and four. After, the oh, one and four. <clears throat> yeah. And then they went um, and beat Edmonton out. Yeah. But yes. But it was fans were livid. They were ready to to throw this team over the plane. Make this team. It was it was brutal. And Walk then the, the team. Plank, is that what you yes. Want? And then the team. <laughs> Lost one and one one, so they were two and five. And then they had a bye week, 
and, and, they, the and they went six and one down the stretch. Yeah. Dave Dickinson and his coaching staff will get in there and study it. And I honestly, as you said, there were things to like in the game against Winnipeg. There was a lot to like in the game against Saskatchewan. I do think that a win here does a ton for the confidence. Yeah. Um, puts you at two and three. You've got Ottawa coming up. Like it, you can. This is very salvageable, and I would preach patience. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not overly concerned. I feel like they're still going to be in the playoffs, but it's one of those things where you still have to do the things to get in the playoffs. So mm-hmm. you have to do. You have to win these games and win these games that you should win. So this is a team that you're facing. Like this is where your direct rival. You got to beat them once in a while. You can't go into that. Like they've got Saskatchewan again at home at the end of the year. You can't go into that and going, well, we have no chance of winning the season series. Like you need to be able to win the season series. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. Ian, I don't know if you want me to plug anything for you. Is there uh, anywhere uh, people can find no, you? No, I don't. I don't. All right. Uh, you guys all have my number, right? Do you want me before we cut away to, to Louis, whose last name I'm not sure about? Uh, you can just listen to me do an ad read uh, really quickly because. Oh, yeah. Um, this is exciting. I was hoping to see some uh, I know, I, Fraser and I Fig forgot, down here. I forgot. I will bring Fraser and Fig. There's, I'm having a Fraser and Fig party pretty soon. Okay. Uh, the Suskind Stampede over with. Uh, honestly, we are brought to you by Fraser and Fig. These guys are amazing. They're just here in Marta Loop. Uh, they do delicious elevated cheese and charcuterie. Uh, it's all made with fresh artisanal provisions. Uh, I actually have had one of these, just not on air, and I need to get it on air so that people can see it because right. it's an amazing product. But, like, honestly, every one of these cheese charcuterie boxes, it's curated with local and artisanal ingredients. They got four sizes. I'm going to get a single one just for myself, maybe, well, and I'm going to eat it on air. Thing. I think you should get a big one, and you, me and Bender can just crush it. That's true. That, would be, that would be amazing. That's I'll do that for Labor Day. I'll do yeah, that for Labor yeah, Day. Okay. Um, anyways, all boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Honestly, it varies month to month. It's never the same. Check these guys out. Tell them I sent you. I'd really appreciate it. Ian Buzzy, I really appreciate you, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I, yeah. Louis Butko, you have told me. I, I right before coming on air, acknowledged that I didn't actually know how to say your last name. Uh, Ian Busby also got it wrong. He told me some some great stories about you guys having a good time in Grey Cup in 2017, uh, you and RJ. Um, but, Louis, you're a reporter with CHCH in Hamilton. Uh, you were, honestly, a former Ticats host for, for years and years. You were my guy who, when I had a question about the Ticats, I always went to you. Um, my first question will be, how are you doing? My second question is, are you now going to be given an all-star vote? Or... Where are we at? <laughs> yeah, okay, so I hope. I hope. Uh, I'm doing great, man. Um, and it is it is a true honor uh, to get to return the favor for the uh, all the times, the countless times uh, you came on my shows uh, over the years. So, uh, like I said, it's an honor to be uh, here with you. Uh, and I think so is the answer to that question. I was talking to Steve Milton about this a couple of weeks ago, last time I was down there. And uh, uh, there, there was some drama, not going to lie, about you know, whether or not I was going to have a vote. Uh, and I haven't as a member, uh, uh, as an employee of the Ticats back in the day. So I hope I haven't gotten confirmation. I think the ball is in uh, is in motion. I will say, I will say I did get a, a CFL top 50 vote. Uh, that being from our, our friend Dave Naylor, who reached out Good to me, hear. and I was very honored to do that. Uh, but it was at a busy time, so I didn't get to vote, or else I would have made them public because I think that's uh, important. So I'm going to make yep. an excuse. I was invited, but I was too busy, so I didn't vote. And there's like some reasons that. for that. Like I like, I like to ask guys down at practice too, like like asking the players about guys on other teams. I think that's super important. I would have reached out to guys like you if I had had the time or just other people, you know, DT in Winnipeg. I think that's really important when you're putting in that vote because I know a lot of people don't talk to anybody when they make that vote and, you know, they cover one city or they stay in one city. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I try to respect the process of the CFL Top 50 just because I know how hard Naylor works at putting it together. He does. So I he didn't vote. Long it. story story. Uh, and anyway, these long-winded, to two simple questions. I'm doing good, and I hope so. I got a CFL yeah. vote soon. I am not going to make anyone stir the pot, but I will say as a long-time uh, all-star voter, um, Louis should have a vote. I, there is oh, literally you, nobody who – over the years was at the Thai Cats more than you. Uh, Milty was obviously there a lot, but you were there the most. You were the most knowledgeable person in media about the Thai Cats. I understand the reasons why team employees don't get a media vote. Now that you are pure media, there is no one more qualified 
to vote out of Hamilton than you. So Danny Austin is fully endorsing it. Um, we'll get Jeff Hamilton on yeah. the phone. Well, I was about to say, when you come to Hamilton, uh, you know, in a couple of months, Grey Cup, uh, you know, coming up very soon in Hamilton. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Let me just say, uh, you and I have had the the pleasure of getting to share a couple of Grey Cups uh, together over the last few years. Uh, me getting to come to Calgary. Uh, you getting to come to Hamilton. I'm really excited you're uh, you're coming back to Hamilton again. I don't know if that like it better be in your plans. I'm not sure if you've confirmed. Anything, oh no, I'm but... coming. I okay. <laughs> I haven't worked yeah. it out um, yeah. exactly how. Now part of the advantage I have is obviously I'm from Toronto, so there are ways to to sort of yeah. do it. Like I'm not going to pay for an entire week at Grey Cup uh, if I'm like I I've been to enough that I don't I don't necessarily have to do that, and I feel like yeah. I should be being paid to be there. Um, but I I will be. There's no yeah. way I'm missing it. Um, yeah, I will say been, if it somehow ends up being Winnipeg Hamilton again, I'm not doing it. Um, <laughs> I've covered just, enough just straight up bombers. Like yeah, I've covered enough bombers, tie cats. Um, but you know, there's a <laughs> right now that doesn't necessarily look the way it's going to go. Oof. Let me ask you some football questions. Yeah, um, before I feel like the tie cats looked a little bit. I'm, I know it was Ottawa. I was talking to Buzzy about it. It looked like they were more cohesive and that they were all on the same page a little bit more this weekend. I still am a believer that this team is going to turn the corner. There's too much talent there. There's too many professionals. You can, you in general feel feeling better after I know it's a win and that'll always make Hamilton feel better. But do you think I sh I'm accurate saying that? I think so. But I think it comes with a ca caveat of just, just how close that game was and just how close it shouldn't have been. Um, you know, defensively, the Ticats were so good. Like, they were killers. That looked like a Mark Washington team that had been playing together for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and, and that's not what they had looked like. They had looked like a lot of good guys from other cities coming together. Hey, you were really good here. You were really good here. They hadn't played well together. You lost a guy like Jovan Santos Knox. Like, the Ticats defense, if that's who they were against the Ottawa Red Blacks, I'm not worried about them anymore. Mm -hmm. Offensively, was it their best game? How does Tim White finish a game with one catch for seven yards? Like how, That shouldn't happen. Tim White's a thousand-yard receiver. You have to find a way to get the ball in his hands. Like, I'm sorry. I, that that kind of threw me off. But I really like Matt Schiltz. I've, I've, I've been a Matt Schiltz fan since he was in Montreal. Um, you know, it, it's tough to be a backup quarterback in this league. You and I have talked to enough of those guys. And and the good thing about this league is a lot of those backups go on to be starters. And if you put your time in and if you, you know, you learn from the guys who played ahead of you, you're going to have success. There's a reason Zach Caleros, Jeremiah Masoli, thinking of him, by the way, and uh, yeah. just awful to see that last week. Um, Dane Evans. There's a reason all these former Ty Cats guys are in other teams. Vernon Adams Jr. was on a Ty Cats roster uh, a few months ago. So uh, Matt's one of those guys that I think is is picking up the playbook uh, with Tommy's offense. Um, so uh, if the offense can put together a, a solid game tomorrow night against the Elks, then I'm a bit more on your side, Danny. That like this team is better than their record suggests. If they lay an egg against Edmonton, if they can't put up more than against 25 Edmonton. points but yeah. like if they can't put up more than 20 points against the elks like defensively the elks are good don't get me wrong like that's their strength right now but you don't want to be that footnote in history that ended the elks losing streak right no especially really this team especially be. right now where there's so much expectation for the tie cats to be in the great cup this year it is being built up as the party of the year even more so than what 2021 is. Like there's a lot of expectations that this team is going to be in the great cup this game. It's July. We and I can shrug our shoulders. We're not even halfway through July. There's a lot of football left to be played, but come week 18, when they're battling for a bye week or a home playoff game, this game is going to be important when we look back in a few weeks. Oh, I want to be like really, really, really clear that if they lose to the Elks, tomorrow I, I take back everything i said <laughs> um but there is that part of me and, and, and i do think like inevitably part of it is just that i know so many of these guys from their time in calgary but like mm. i know what jameer thurman is you know what i mean i i know who jv and elliot is um there's yeah. there's just so much talent jagger davis like it it would 
really surprise me if it doesn't come together defensively. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's just too much talent. And I do imagine, and this is something that I that happened with the Stampeders, particularly in their sort of powerhouse years, was some of their veteran guys, you know, you don't go as hard with them in training camp and in preseason. So it may take them a couple of weeks to actually sort of hit their stride. Um, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that that happened. I wasn't at tie catch camp. Um, it just, it felt a little bit like a circus a little bit for the first couple of weeks. And then I, I sort of watched and I, I hear you, it was at 21, 13, right? It was 21, yep. 13 yep. win over arguably the second worst team in the league, but it just, it felt like, okay, this is a team that is, was focused on, on the basics and on, yep. on doing their jobs. And that's all you want from a football team at this team time of the year in the CFL. And don't get me wrong, like Mark Leggio going five for five isn't insignificant in a game like that, right? Where you needed him to be good. Yeah, he missed the convert, and we'll talk about that. He's missed a couple already this year. But him going five for five and having that confidence, like it's it's underrated, especially in today's CFL, just how what a difference a good kicker can make, right? <laughs> the difference between a good kicker and a bad kicker, and I, like Mark Leggio has proven himself. He did all three jobs in Winnipeg well for the last few years. Like I'm not saying anyone was questioning him, but it was nice to see something like that where, okay, now I don't have to worry about it. That's what I was saying earlier. Like I'm not worried about the defense anymore. There were some concerns about what it could do. But you look at Jay, uh, you know, you look at uh, Teddy Laurent has turned back the clock in the last few years. He was a guy that a lot of people had written off years ago. Like he's just a backup, he's just a Canadian. He's going out there and he's contributing and looking good doing it. And uh, yeah, all those new faces that the Ticats brought in defensively, I think it would have been silly to th- assume that they would have gelled game one, game two. Like these are guys with a lot of experience from a lot of different teams. And with experience comes like a little bit of swagger, right? And thinking that you know it's right. And you and I have been in locker rooms where it's taken a bit longer to click, but when it clicks, it works. And I think the defense has figured that out. And I think the offense has the potential to figure that out against Edmonton. I had Alex Singleton on the show probably like a month ago. And he was talking about like, since he's gone to the NFL in 2019, it's been a new playbook every single year for him. And he was talking about like, just how, you know, Alex isn't complaining about his life. He's just bought a house with a library in it. He's, (laughs) He's doing pretty well on his NFL. I believe he got 10 million guaranteed, not complaining, but saying he's like, that's one of the things people don't, understand is you, when you go to a new team or you get a new defensive coordinator it's not the same job anymore so i think that a, you know a guy like jameer thurman having to come in and i'm not saying he was part of the problem but having to learn no. it all like yeah <laughs> give him a couple weeks you yeah. know it's gonna take it's, a little while and especially with a coach like mark washington and and like there's there was i don't think there was ever a panic about the defense because like the defense was consistently solid you know that's that's been a really good thing we've seen through them but like look at all those names we've said over the last you know, 10 minutes of us talking defensively. Like, yeah, they should click. They should be working. But there's a lot of changes. You know, yeah, you look at the guys who did leave. I'm I'm ready for Dylan Wynn to get back in that lineup too. And, and he's going to come back motivated, wanting to contribute. He didn't like the way his season ended last year. He knows how awesome it is to play in the Grey Cup in Hamilton. So there's a lot of motivation in that room. And, and you know, we ask Coach about it a lot. Like, I haven't been around a lot this season, but when I am, you know, it's always brought up like the Grey Cup is here. The Grey Cup is here. Like they know that. It's okay. something that was addressed week one, but it's always in the back of your mind, whether somebody's thinking it or not. You're always thinking like Grey Cup here. We've well, a lot of them in the room have gone through it. They want to go through it again and actually finish the job. And I imagine the fact that they made it in 2021 and were so close to winning that game. Like they felt it. They experienced it. Every team has that thing. But the fact that it's back two years later, you still have a lot of pieces of the court. There's all probably even more pressure because of what happened two years ago. And there's no guarantee a game is coming back anytime soon. <laughs> like that was, I mean, like, let's, let's be honest. I mean, 2021, we knew that the Ticats were going to get another within the yeah. next few years. Like it was, it was kind of like, you know, I don't know if it was anything we reported, but it was just one of those things that you knew like, okay, yeah, the Ticats are getting, not the full experience, they're going to get another one soon. We don't know I when might, the next time the we, Hamilton's going to I get. might be crazy, but I actually think that we, like, that was public. Like, yeah, I okay, do, yeah. Honest, like, I think yeah. they announced, like, I, I don't know how they changed it, like, when they, but you, like, we'll have to go back. COVID brain is really, uh, is real yeah. here, talking about this. Well, and um, I mean, again, 
the fact that that gray cop went off at all is an absolute miracle because the Omicron virus literally hit. Like I got back from yeah. Hamilton to Calgary and two days later, it was like, oh, there's this new variant that's wiping everyone out. And somehow we were all able to just like By hang out in hotel rooms. That Christmas, parties. that Christmas, we were back down to really restrictive stages here in Ontario. Yep. Like, like, yeah, you, you, we talked about that and we were tested every day. It was an experience. So like, that's why like, there's a lot of so much trouble because Don Jackson came up and gave me a hug when he saw oh. me because he'd been in Calgary. I got yeah. in so much trouble from the CFL. And it's like, I didn't hug him. He hugged yeah. me. And it would have been Donnie J too, out of all people, of by course. the way. Great dude. Great dude. Mutual nice. friend of us both. Um, but yeah, like I, like, I think everybody knows in Hamilton, the great cups here, they know the expectation. They want to be there. There's, there shouldn't be any panic. You look at what's happening in the rest of the CFL East division, like is Montreal really the second best team in the east like right now yeah but if the tie cats string together a couple of nice looking wins like i think you have to readjust that and and are the argos for real like you and i haven't I been the argos to, are like, for real and I, it literally yeah. was going to be my next question like describe to me what the mood would be with the gray cup in hamilton <laughs> and it's the east final and the tie cats have to go to toronto to try to keep them out of the home locker room like that that's the type of thing that would get everybody. Even Argos fans would be hyped for that. Like that's, that's sort of the ideal scenario that I can think of. Going in, like playing at BMO field in the East final, you were yeah. them who's playing next week at Tim Hortons field, like a, a snowy, like that could like that. Get, that gets, that's why football is so romantic. I mean, you and I can sit here and talk about this now, but we could also be a few months from now, looking around at BMO field, living that experience. So yep. um, yeah, that's, that's a crazy uh, hypothesis there. Um, I think that now that you're putting it out in the universe, it's pretty crazy. Um, but no, it sort I, of happened in, it sort of happened in 2021. It's just 2021 was so weird. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. 2021, the way that year ended, um, you know, for, for a lot of reasons was, you know, there was the rumors at the Grey Cup, what was happening with Coach O going into a new season, off season, right? Like there was all that drama surrounding what had just happened. And like you said, Omicron started right away. So it was like one of those period of times where it was just like, what's happening? Um, but but yeah, man, like, I, I don't know, like back to your question about this, like knowledge of the Grey Cup. Everybody knows it. Everybody in that locker room knows it. It's it's around the corner and they want to do it right this year. Um. Any idea when Bo's going to be back? No idea. No, no idea. idea. Like, I, I would like to think, you know, Dave Naylor's reporting is is right. Like, you know, I haven't it heard almost, anyone. Dave, Dave's reporting is almost. Is yeah. Not I mean, almost he doesn't put it, it out. Almost. He doesn't put it out there, right? So, uh, and uh, nobody's pushed back on anything other than that. Like, the fears of it being longer term. Like, I wouldn't know. I'm not around the room much, which is super weird for me. Like, you said, <laughs> like, you know, we were talking about, like, quitting every, you know, walking away and be like, Oh, that's my last season. Like for it to actually have been my last season last year, it's, it's a little weird. I'm there every once in a while I make to a few games, but uh, yeah, man, it's, it's been a change for sure. Yeah. Well, dude, you're the best. I'm not going to keep you for any longer. Um, no, all good. Well, <laughs> no. it's stampede. I'll let you get back. I'll let you get back, man. It's stampede. Honestly, week. I'm honored to be on stampede week. Yeah. I mean, thank you. Honestly, I'm honored to have you on. I, I am not, joking i'm saying this sincerely that like you were for years the guy who i was like i need to know what's happening in hamilton you were always my guy i've always appreciated you and uh thank you so much man well uh, yeah. we're, we're gonna have you on again so absolutely man feeling is mutual all the best you are part of this community and you always will be thank you cheers louis all right that was uh louis bucko from uh chgh in hamilton worked with the tie cats for years one of my favorite people in the entire sort of Canadian football community, it was great to have him on. Uh, he's doing a little bit less football coverage uh, this year than he has in the past, but honestly, he's still as knowledgeable a person about the Ticats and, and the East Division in general as anyone you're going to find. So I want to thank him. I want to thank Ian Busby. That was amazing. He came in sort of last minute uh, with absolutely no plan and just kind of, you know, shot it with me for a little bit, and I really appreciated that. And then, of course, I want to thank Fraser and Fig. Talked with them a lot. Just real quick, again, they do these cheese charcuterie boxes. Um, it's all super artisanal ingredients. It's amazing stuff. Four sizes. All boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Check these guys out. They're here in Martelloup. They're perfect for a party, for a picnic, uh, for anything, really. 
Um, I am going to have them on air. I keep promising it's going to be next episode and then I forget to order it um, and regret it every time. It really make me feel like a dummy. But guys, thank you for thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Please tell your friends, like, subscribe. Um, hopefully you like what we're doing here. And uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. So thank you. And uh, yeah, stay blessed. Enjoy Stampede if you're here in Calgary. Enjoy your summer wherever else you're, you are. Wish that. I hadn't messed up my last sentence there. Thanks again, guys. Cheers.